Sometimes continuing in the work that God has called you to can be hard. There are pressures and hassles and difficulties and opposition and stresses and strains that can just make you want to give up. The voice of somebody telling you that you're not good enough, the ideas that come from the culture that tell you that you're not being effective, the church that you're leading, staying small, the ministry that you're involved in not working, maybe laziness or fear or anxiety or apathy or sin or shame or opposition, but it can be so easy to stop, can't it? It's always been the same in the church, you know. Christians have always needed to be reminded that we need to keep going. That's why Paul said, do not become weary in well-doing, because in due season you will reap if you continue to sow. It's why we read in the Psalms, strengthen the feeble arms and strengthen those knees that are bending under the weight. It's why Jesus said, a bruised reed I will not break and a smoldering flax I will not extinguish. I've been in pastoral ministry for over 35 years and on a couple of occasions, I felt the weight of it so much that I thought, I don't know if I can keep going. The opposition or the hassle or the challenge or the reality that this is going to take a lifetime and another lifetime and another lifetime, the small wins that we so often see. And yet God encourages us to keep going. I want to encourage you today to keep going by taking a look at one little book in the Old Testament and seeing what it has to say to us. It's the book of Haggai. And I pray that as we consider it, you'll be blessed, you'll be inspired, you'll be encouraged, and you'll be challenged by what God says to his people Israel and by what we can take from that. Thank you so much to God Day for inviting me to share with you and to Revelation TV for inviting me to take part in their broadcasts. I'm so honored and I'm so very grateful. Turn in your Bibles then to the book of Haggai, and we are going to read actually the whole book together, but not all in one sitting. You'll be glad to know. Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You have looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house lies in ruins, while all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of the prophet Haggai, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month. God always blesses 
the public reading of his inspired and his infallible word. The book of Haggai records four prophetic words that were given to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah called Israel in this passage between August 520 BC and December 520 BC. In this tiny short period, God has so much to say to these people. And if we will listen, he has so much to say to us. If we will allow ourselves to listen to the Spirit, just as the Spirit is speaking, as you heard from those words, he will speak into our hearts and our souls. But to understand the significance of what is happening here, I need to paint a bit of background. Back in 539 or somewhere around that, 540 perhaps, BC, the people of Israel who had been um, in, occupied and exiled by the Babylonians now have new taskmasters because the Medes and the Persians have driven out the Babylonians. And now they have a new overlord. Some of the people that are in that context are Daniel and his friends. The captivity of the southern kingdom of Israel began in 606 BC. And in three routes, probably around 606, around 595 and around 584, three groups of people from the southern kingdom of Israel um, are taken into exile in Babylon, modern day Iraq. The first are artisans and leaders. The second are uh, people that are in the kind of middle classes, if you like. And the third is everybody else. And they're told as they go into exile that they will spend 70 years in exile, that they will be away from their homeland for 70 years. Remember that in 722 BC, the Assyrians had taken the 10 tribes of the north into exile too. And the southern kingdom thought, this will never happen to us. We'll never face this. We'll never go through this. But they did. And Jeremiah bewails what he sees. That's why he writes the book of Lamentations. But in chapter 29, he tells them, the people of Israel, as we have it, he tells them that God says, this isn't the end of your story. Um, I know the plans I have for you. Verse 11, plans to bless you and prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. But he also explains that they will go into exile for 70 years. So they go into exile, jump forward to this new overlord, the Medes and the Persians, led by King Cyrus. And you're in the time that we are now with Haggai. But just a few years before this, Daniel had been reading that very letter from Jeremiah. And in chapter 9 of Daniel, we record that he reads it and he realizes the 70 years is almost up. We're nearly at the time when the exile is going to come to an end. And that's exactly what happens. If you go to the British Museum today and you go to room 50, you can see Cyrus's cylinder where the announcement is made that all of the Jews can return to their holy land and build their temple. Not only can they return, he offers to help pay for it. So in 537, the Jews return, at least some of them. Many of them choose to remain in the wilderness of exile rather than go back to the hard work of rebuilding the temple. That's interesting, isn't it? And some of those that remain are probably the ancestors of the Magi who come looking for Jesus because they had this um, knowledge of the scriptures and an awareness of the Messiah. But those that go back, go back in 537 and they start to rebuild the temple. And then they stop. And we don't know why they stop, but they stop. Jump forward from 537 to 520, 17 years later. And God raises the prophet Haggai to encourage them to take up the work again. He encourages them to keep going. Now, when we read the first prophetic word given in August 520 in Haggai chapter 1, you have some difficult questions coming from the voice of the Lord. He says, why have you stopped? Why have you stopped rebuilding? We know it's not because they don't have enough resources, because he says you live in paneled houses. You've got money. You've got materials but they stopped. Maybe they stopped because of opposition. Maybe they stopped because of complacency. Maybe they stopped because the people around them were mocking them. We know that that also happens as we read the other historical books of the Old Testament. Maybe they stopped because of infighting and because of competition and because of comparison. Maybe they stopped because of a lack of leadership. Maybe they stopped because of spiritual apathy. There are dozens of reasons for stopping in God's work, but they stop and they feel the impact of stopping. As you read Haggai chapter 1, God asks penetrating and difficult questions of these people. He says to them, um, you're discontent. 
You're eating, but never full. You're drinking, but never satisfied. You're putting your money into pockets with holes in it. Your, your um, harvests aren't working. Things are sticky. And I have caused it because you're not building my house. You're not giving energy to the temple. You're not doing what you came to do. And he calls them to take up their work again through Haggai. He calls them to put their hand to the plow again because he hasn't finished with them. And he's not afraid to name their sin. He's not afraid to say you're complacent and you're discontented and you're unhappy and you're blaming it on everything else. But I've caused it because I want your attention. I want you to build with me. I want you to build my temple. Could there be a more important word for the Christian church today? Build God's people. Build God's kingdom. Invest in God's purposes. So often we are discontent, we are dissatisfied, we are thirsty, we feel as if we're not making progress. And maybe God is saying to us, because you're not following me, because you're not putting my principles in place, because you're not listening to my voice. But in this first word, we see them responding. And as they respond one by one, Zerubbabel the governor, Joshua the son of Jehoshadak the high priest, and then the people, one by one, they respond. And God promises them the moment they respond, it's amazing. God says, my spirit is with you. And we're told in chapter one that they commenced the work. This first word from Haggai to the people of Israel was to commence the work and they do it. And this first part of this book to you today is commence the work. God hasn't finished with you yet. He's calling you and me to continue to invest in his purposes and to trust him and to put our hand to the ply and to be honest about our need of his grace and the great and exciting call of following him. Let's look at the second word that we read in Haggai chapter 2. In the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, this is just a little while later, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left amongst you? that saw this house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the promises that I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit abides amongst you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of the house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. Here's the second word. He says, I'm going to do it. But he asks them a question. He says, are there any amongst you who remember this house in its former glory? And there would be very few. There might be a handful. But they're talking about the temple before it was destroyed, before it was pulled down. And now here they are back amongst ruins. And God says, can you see through the ruins to what I want to do? Can you see through the rubble and receive the revelation of the reality of what I'm going to do with you, my people? And he says, keep working because I'm with you. And he lifts their eyes and he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. I will provide. I will bring wealth from the nations. I will do it in ways that are supernatural that you've never experienced before. And in this place, I will grant my peace. Now, here's the thing before I move on from this. The temple that was rebuilt after they went back eventually wasn't as big as the one that was there before. There's never been one as big as the one that was there before. So this passage could well be pointing right the way forward to the time when a great new temple will be built in Jerusalem and it will be full of dazzling, dazzling, dazzling beauty. It could also point to the new Jerusalem. But I have a feeling that it points to a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and that God is pointing these people all the way forward. In the first instance, he's saying, you rebuild this temple, but he's also pointing much, much further forward. And he's saying that he'll grant us peace in that place. And I also have a sense that he's pointing to the Lord Jesus, who is at the center of all things and who gives peace and hope to all who will trust in him. 
But this second word is a word of encouragement. Keep going. I'm with you. I'm going to do it. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to help for you. When we get weary in our work, we need to be reminded that God is still with us, that he can still do it. When we think there's not enough resource, we need to remember he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. When we feel the heat of opposition, we need to remember that God is present and able to defend us and guide us and lead us. Just as God said to the people of Haggai here in this second word, he says to us today, keep going. Keep going with the vision I've placed in your heart, the dream I've placed in your soul, the call I've placed in your life. It's not about your resources, it's about his. It's not about your cleverness, it's about his wisdom. It's not about your resilience, it's about his faithfulness. Keep going. Lean into the God who promises never to leave us or forsake us and who will finish the work. Let's look at the third word from the Lord in Haggai. Verse 10 of chapter 2. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests for a ruling. If one carries consecrated meat in the fold of one's garment, and with the fold touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priests answered, No. Then Haggai said, If one is unclean by contact with a dead body, and touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered, yes, it becomes unclean. Haggai then said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, says the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. But now consider what will come to pass from this day on. Before a stone has been placed upon a stone in the Lord's temple, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat, to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. Consider from this day on, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is there any seed left in the barn? Do the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree still yield nothing? From this day on, I will bless you. A third word from the Lord, which is both a rebuke and a promise. And here's what it is. Firstly, God says to the people, if something clean touches someone else, does the someone else become clean? And the answer is no. And secondly, if something unclean touches someone else, does the someone else become unclean? And the answer is yes. This is something that is never preached on in the church and needs to be heard about more. Sin is contagious. Holiness is not. When we live lives of sin, we infect our communities. Everybody around us is impacted by it. But holiness must be something that is chosen as a personal conviction, a personal surrender. I can't surrender for someone else. I can't make someone else holy, but I can make someone else be drawn into sin. And God says to the people here in this passage, you're building the temple, but you're not sorting out your lives. And he goes on to say, you're being unjust in your measures. You're giving people half measures. You're cheating people. Stop. And he calls them to repentance on the inside to match their labor on the outside. And then he says, the minute you do that, from this day on, I will bless you. The fourth and fifth time we hear, consider your ways is in chapter two. And he says, what little seed is left in the barn, what little pomegranates are left, what little fruit you have, what little resource you have, see how I will bless you as you turn not only your hand to me, but your heart. There's the promise again, the call to you and me, just as it was to Israel, to turn not just our labor to the Lord, but our love, to not just turn our materials, but our minds, to turn our hands and our hearts to God. And when we do, he blesses us. He can take the little bit that's left and use it for his glory. He can take the little energy. He can take the little idea. He can take the little seed. He can take the tiny amount of resource we have. And when we give it with willing hearts, and when we give it with a desire to be holy and faithful and obedient to him, he blesses it. What a call. And so we come to the fourth and last word spoken to Haggai and to the people of Israel. Found from verse 20 to the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Two words in one day. 
Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Judah, a governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the kingdom, the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall fall, every one by the sword of a comrade. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. This is a promise of ultimate and complete restoration. God says, I know the empires of the world. I know the kingdoms of the world. I know their strength. I know their greatness. I know that they rely on horses and chariots. But I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I am going to restore you completely and fully. And then he uses this beautiful picture. He says to Zerubbabel, and I will place you like a signet ring upon my finger. Back in Jeremiah, as the people of Israel were being brought into exile, God had said to Jeconiah, the king at that time, I have taken you off my finger like a signet ring, and I have flown, th flung you into the vast expanse of sea. Here we are seeing a promise of a reversal of that punishment, that God will take Israel and place it like a signet ring upon his finger. This is a prophetic word about what God's heart is for his people, Israel. It's about the promise, not only that the temple will be rebuilt, not only that the glory of the Lord will visit Jerusalem, but that God's people are God's people always, held securely by him. What a hope for them to hold on to. What a promise for us to pray into as Christians, as we stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters who trust Christ and pray that God would work in their hearts powerfully and that they would be restored. But make no mistake about it, this isn't an if. There's no conditionality upon this promise in chapter 2, verse 20. This is a full and complete promise of, promise of restoration. And through it, we can know the promise of restoration too. Four promises over four months, August, September, October, November, and the beginning of December, spoken by a little-known prophet to a tiny nation. The first saying to them, start the work again, stop making excuses. The second saying, I will provide for you and sustain you, and the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. The third saying, this must not just be an external work. This must be a work in your heart that sees holiness promoted and obedience followed. And the fourth saying, I will complete this. This is God's word for you today. There are women and men listening to me and you've lost your way. You've got caught up with materialism or with fear or with anxiety or concern. Come home. Come back to the God who wants to use you. Put your hand to the ply again. Give him the opportunity to move in you and through you and to use your life for his glory. But it's also a call to people who have never yet trusted in God. This great temple at the center is a temple where the lamb will be worshipped. The lamb is Jesus. He's described as the one who is the light of the world. And he is so beautiful that in the new creation there will be no need for a son because he will be the light. And yet John tells us that he was the lamb that was slain by the, before the foundations of the earth. And by his blood, we are cleansed and purchased for God. Have you been washed in the blood? Have you been cleansed by the grace of Jesus? Have you knelt at the cross? Because all of this only makes sense through the power of Jesus at the cross. And I invite you, if you've never responded to him, to respond to him today. Whilst you have time, whilst the end is not yet, the end is near. I plead with you to surrender to Christ, to lay down your life before him and see what he can do. And if you are already his follower, to take up your sword again, to take your position in the battlefield and to be all that God has called you to be. Will you pray with me as we respond to God's word to us today? Father, I lift to you those who have taken their eye off your call upon their lives those who have laid down their swords, those who have given up in their fight, those who have settled. And I pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, that they will be given the grace to pick up the sword, to find their place in the line, and to play their part. Remind them that you will restore them. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them and keep them and hold them. And today I pray for those who are coming to Jesus for the first time. May they know the forgiveness of sin. 
May they know new life. May they know the power of the blood, setting them free and giving them hope. And I pray for all of us. We give you what we have. Some of us give you what we have left. And we look at it and it feels so little. It feels so small and so insignificant. But we thank you that you can take what is remaining of the pomegranate and the vine, what is remaining of the oil, and use it for your glory. And I pray that you will take what we have and who we are, and you will shine through us for your glory, and you'll use us for the honor of your name and for your kingdom. Forgive us for our sin. Restore us to a passionate, deep, and ongoing faithfulness to your Son. Empower us by the presence and the promise of your Spirit, and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. Sisters and brothers, I know how hard it can be to start again. I know that we can find it difficult. But I pray today that you will respond to the grace of God. I really sense his spirit at work in this message. And I know that there will be many that will want to make a response. The good folks here at Revelation TV are available to help you if you are recommitting your life. If you want to send them a prayer request or an email, if you want to tell them that you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, they're here to help you. They're here to encourage you. They're here to support you. They're here to enable you to live faithfully for Jesus. I want to thank you so much for listening today, but I want to say this to you. I'm not a perfect Christian. I have taken my eye off the ball. I have fallen many times. I have faltered many times. But here's the wonderful truth of the gospel. When we cast our eyes to Jesus, he leans with us. He picks us up, he strengthens us, he gives us hope, he dusts us down, and he says, I'm not finished with you yet. Amen. <laughs>